um, with Anvil. So I'll turn it over to you, Vince, and um, feel free to share your screen and walk us through stuff. Thanks, Martin. We will share screen. I hope folks can see what I am seeing, which is a bioconductor workshop in the workspaces panel. And um, I have a 17-page printout, which is the Google Doc that's referenced in the chat. I hope folks are feeling comfortable just sort of interrupting uh, by unmuting themselves and, and talking. If anything uh, goes wrong, even for their own little activities, uh, what, what's surprising to me is that the 17-page printout, eight, eight pages of them are devoted to getting to start our studio. And that is an uncommon situation. We usually just turn on our laptop and turn on our studio. So um, I'm going to step through these issues to make sure that everybody can get to where they would like to be, which is essentially to have a copy of this, this workspace. Um, that they own, and uh, then they will start a runtime associated with that. And um, the the document, uh, which I I guess we can just sort of I, I guess in order to get here, you should have your Anvil account and have started Anvil. If anybody is not there, uh, please chime in. And I think the first thing we want to do uh, is, if you haven't signed in, you've gotten to app.terra.bio, you've signed in, and you should be able to see workspaces. Now, I'm hearing some construction noises. I hope they would have stopped at noon, but they have not, I think. Uh, it'll be intermittent, but if you I'll have that's problems, from you Charlotte. Need... Sorry? That's probably from Charlotte. Oh, no, it's me. <laughs> no, they stopped here. They've oh. stopped here now. New building is being done. I'm going to start using the headphones, which should be a little more focus. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Let's let's deal with it that way. If you have more problems, just interrupt, please. Can can someone say something so that I can just do a check? You sound more tinny, but we but there's less construction noise. Okay. For now, I'm going to do it this way. So the basic idea is that you will have access to this um, workspace page, and you can find the Bioconductor Workspace OSCA 312. If you can, please chime in. Um, if you click on that, you will uh, be able to clone it by coming up to this teardrop here and hitting the clone button. And when you do that, you will uh, have the ability to name it as you like. And so I'll say Mon VJC for this workspace. And the billing project that you should select would be Deep Pilots Bioconductor May 17th. Once you've got that done, you can hit clone workspace, and that's a pretty fast operation. This is now your own workspace. And the description of what goes on in the workspace is uh, pretty complete here. And we're going to follow these steps. But real quick, when we, uh, you're accessing this initially from workspaces, is that what you said? Yes. So and I'll then... go back there. If you search workspaces for uh, bioconductor, uh workshop Oscar so you have to spell it absolutely correctly you will eventually see that oh and once you minute. yeah wait a minute yeah I'm not getting that result under my workspaces okay you um so have you registered for this? 
And are you using the same identity that you use to register for this? Is this? Yeah, this yeah. is me, Sarah. Yeah, yeah I'm, okay. I'm pretty sure I'll check my profile and I'll talk, talk to you again and you can keep going to not let everybody. Yeah, the profile, you need to use the email that you use to mm -hmm. register okay. for your uh, session here. Okay. But we can go Sarah. over this another time. Sarah, feel free to chat and with your login and credentials and we'll arrange things for you. So. Thank you. Yeah, good idea. Okay, so going back now to the uh, workspaces here. Uh, the workspace I wanna work with is the one I just created. Which has its own name. Uh, and now we can uh, create a new workspace. We clicked on that. Here we go. We make a clone, a teardrop, and um, owned. the billing project is set. And now we need to create a cloud environment. And that's uh, being blocked here by the uh, all these stuff here. So everybody should be at this point where they have a Deep Pilots Bioconductor May 17th and a Bioconductor Workshop copy of the orchestrating single cell analysis. If not, let me know. And our job now is to create the appropriate cloud environment to work with the book. And it's going to be a highly customized approach. So when you click on this cloud environment gear here, you will take the customize option. And then we are going to customize it even further. So when you hit customize, you'll get to this application configuration. And you need to click on that and then go all the way to the bottom for a custom environment. And once we do that, we're going to enter a very special code into this container image. It's VJC ITN, VJC OSCA, colon 0 0.0.1. This contains all the software needed to work with the book. A lot of bioconductor software, a lot of our software. And we would have liked to have made it a non-custom environment, but we're not quite there yet. So this is based on a Docker container that deals with all the things that you need to work with the book. It's publicly accessible. You can always use it, but it isn't the most straightforward way of using Anvil. Once you have this configuration in place, get a better computer. Uh, pick one with four CPUs and 15, megabyte, 15 gigabytes of memory. And your persistent disk, 50 gigabytes is plenty. Okay, so that's what we need to see here. And once we have filled all those out, we can hit next. And it'll tell us it's an unverified Docker image. And um, don't worry about that. Just go ahead and create your runtime. And there it goes. And now if you hit the RStudio, you can see that it will say, let's return in three to five minutes. And so, during those three to five minutes, I thought I would spend a little time just telling you a little more about Bioconductor. And uh, I have a little slideshow. So let's just take these slides for a couple of minutes, and then we'll go back to see when the thing is, is fired up. And you could let me know if you see it fired up. So basically, I want everybody to be aware of Bioconductor as an ecosystem of many things, including the document that we're going to work through Many people that we deal with are basic genome biologists. So they run sequencers. They have to parse the stuff and ultimately run some high dimensional science, data science, statistics, whatever you want to call it, to start interpreting the outputs of these uh, sequencing tools. And what Bioconductor really wants to help you do is get up to the point of where you, you're doing some actual biological inference. Oftentimes that has to do with human disease or organism development and so forth. And this piece of the ecosystem that is the book is um, based on our markdown. And we have really you know, one major author, Aaron Lunn, 
uh, who had a couple of co-authors for this single cell, single cell analysis um, book that we're going to talk about. But it's managed uh, just like anything else in Bioconductor. And just to show you a little bit of, of the scope, once we get into the book, we'll see that there's a large table of contents, and it takes care of things like how do we represent the data on a number of, of cells, millions of cells potentially, uh, in a bioconductor session. So that's, that's what we're trying to get you to. And uh, it's managed just like any other software in bioconductor. There's builds that are done on a, on a frequent basis. In the case of books, it's done every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So the, the code base can be changing uh, regularly in terms of packages that the thing depends upon or the way the author decided to, to describe something. And those things are updated on a regular basis. And here's the next edition. So for Bioconductor 3.13, there's a more um, modular definition uh, of the components of the book that you'll be able to work with. And you can see that there's a problem with one of them, and that'll alert the author, and they'll, they'll fix that up. And one of the reasons I hope you'll like the book is that you get all these wonderful um, uh, narratives uh, of what's going on and the code to demonstrate what's being claimed. And that's why we are going to be uh, working with uh, our studio in Anvil to take care of this. Any questions or comments about Bioconductor? All right, let's see where we are with this. Aha! So folks who have the proper configuration should be seeing a live RStudio session at this point. And I'm going to pump up the font a little bit so that we can all see what's happening. That may lead to some issues, but Let's not worry about it for now. Uh, okay. Anybody want to make some comments about where we are with respect to our studio problems? All right. So we're going to do some unusual things with our studio, at least as far as I'm concerned. I only learned to do this fairly recently. We're going to use the file button and do a new project. And the project we're going to use is a version control project, and it's going to use Git. Okay, I went through that very quickly. You go to File, pick a new project, a version control project, and now we're at this point where we get to clone a Git repository. And we're going to type in HTTPS, github.com, ASCA source, ASCA. Okay? And um, <clears throat> you have to tell RStudio where you want to do this, and it's sufficient to just hit that um, browse button, and it'll, it'll do it under the tilde, the home RStudio. And then you can create the project. And now Git is being used to get all the information that you need in order to work with the book. In fact, it's, it's more information than you need too much and it's too new. We have to back down a bit. And so if you go to the terminal here, we're going to do something a, a little, we're going to do git fetch minus minus all and then git checkout release. Hi. Release 312. Oh, that's not very pleasant. Okay. Git Check out release 312. There we go. Okay. That's to get a version of the book that is consistent with the version of R that we are using and that is also available within Anvil without any special customization. Now that we have that, I'd like to go back to the document and just review a couple of ideas to make sure that everything is on board, above board. So the Google Doc here has gotten us all the way to my little triangle, which is describing Bioconductor. And now we want to go a little bit further in terms of Bioconductor for single cell. And this is a picture that I thought was interesting. It's from one of uh, Aaron Lund's papers. And I've got a link to the paper here. And um, it's, it's a very careful study of how spike in 
um, can be added to single cell RNA seq for normalization. And it's probably a somewhat controversial uh, claim, and it's really nice to be able to back up uh, the, util the claims about the utility of spike and normalization with real data. And that's what uh, was going on here. Uh, so the paper gets into this sort of conjecture that when you do these spike ends, because there's so much technical challenge to getting the stuff in there, uh, it can actually introduce variability. And the claim of the paper is that the fraction of variability introduced by adding the spike ends according to standard protocols is actually a small fraction of overall variability. So it's probably worth doing spike ends if you can. Now that's something everybody can discuss offline. Um, but what I wanted to make sure folks understand is that when you're working with Bioconductor to look at the data from an experiment like this, there's a very standard data structure that can be used called the single cell experiment. And the single cell experiment tells you very patently what's going on. That I've got here a structure that has 46,604 rows, and those are features of the transcriptome, and 185 columns, which are the individual cells. And that structure is a derivative of a more classical structure called the summarized experiment, where we have a, a large assay with many features and a potentially large number of samples, metadata about the samples, metadata about the features, and potentially metadata about the experiment, that all gets put together in a nicely managed structure called summarized experiment, and that just explains that here. The single cell experiment takes that further. So it's the same sort of feature metadata, cell-specific assay data, cell metadata, just as we had in the sample case, but then a number of dimension reductions because it's typically uh, an immediate concern to get these data into some sort of lower dimensional space so that you can reason about what's going on uh, with the experiment. So this is a single cell experiment structure and uh, we're going to be working with those as we work with the book. Any comments or questions? <clears throat> All right. So let's go back to um, R Studio. And now we're going to take advantage of the R Studio console. We've got a checkout of the of the book, and uh, I want to just make sure that we don't get s stumped by a question that Bioconductor uh, Hubs may ask. So let's do the following. Library Experiment Hub, and there'll be some chatter as it brings in all the different things that it needs, and then we'll just do EH equals Experiment Hub, open paren, close paren, and at this point, I get a question. Do I want to create a directory? And the answer is going to be yes. And so it does that. And I'm also going to do AH equals annotation hub. This may not be necessary, but just for the be on the safe side, we'll do that. And now we're not going to be interrupted by any questions. Okay. So now uh, we can explore an experimental data set just to show you what I was talking about here. Uh, library, Celldex. So what is Celldex? Let's take a look. Help, package equals Celldex. And we get information here, reference index for cell types. So what's a reference index? Uh, well, we can learn a little bit more about that by going to the user guides. And in fact, there's a vignette somewhere in here, and we hit that. And a Pokédex for cell types. And this tells you all about uh, what's in there and how these things uh, can be used. So uh, I think you should be able to, to pop that out with a zoom button or something like that. I don't know that much about that. but. Let's just uh, continue with the, uh, we'll try to use this in some way. We'll say ref equals blueprint. Uh, that's no, 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 yeah, there you go. Blueprint encode data, open paren, close paren. And this is now going to use 
the hubs that we just work with, the, the experiment hub, to go and retrieve information uh, from the cloud or from, from your cache to look at this thing, which is REF. So REF is a summarized experiment in this case, it's not a single cell experiment, uh, which um, has 19,000 features and 259 samples. And one of the things that I, I thought was interesting to do is on the next page of the, um, of the Google Doc, to give you a sense of what the annotations are like here. So let's just take a look at that. There's an appendix which shows how to do this, but the basic idea is that this reference data structure has information that you can use to look at the transcriptomes of cells that you might have and help reason about whether those cells are likely to be memory T cells or even subsets of memory T cells, depending on the transcriptional profile that you're able to see. So that's what that cell dex entity is uh, all about. Vince, is this custom container just the, the standard RStudio one with some extra packages installed? Yes, uh, and if you'd like to know a little bit more about that, um, let's, let me just try to remember for a minute uh, what was done. Um, yeah. Let's look at that. It's a good question, and uh, I think we need to um, jump into uh, github.com, a bioconductor, bioconductor docker. Yeah, it's a little esoteric, perhaps, for those people who are here just to learn about Anvil, but um, this is what I, I used here. This, um, this docker file. Uh, but I ran a very specific command inside there that's related to the book. And um, I, I think we'll hold off on the, the actual command, but there's a way to use uh, DevTools, uh, a function in, in DevTools, to, um, in, to, to look at the description file for the book. So if you yeah if we come here and we look at this description file, uh, let's blow this guy up. You'll see that there's a bunch of suggests, and um, I guess that's it. <laughs> a, a large number of packages, each of which has their own dependencies. And the question is, how do you get all of these packages and their dependencies into the container? And there's a very simple command in DevTools that uh, will accomplish that. And I ran that and then uh, committed that container. So that's a somewhat sketchy way to make a container, but it's all based on the, the, the Bioconductor Docker container with this command run to make sure that all the packages are there. And so uh, if we uh, let that come back to the console here and we say here, uh, ii equals, hey, wait a minute equals uh, install.packages, and we just do a dim of ii, we see that there are 369 packages installed, and they were all in the container. So this is what you'd call a fat container. Um, but let's, uh, let's not uh, dwell on that anymore. All right. So now we want to do what the workshop was actually tailored to do, which is to build a chapter of the vignettes a chapter of the book. And the way this is structured is, if you're in the uh, your R Studio, the way we made it, you go into vignettes, and then you drop down one more, um, one more folder, and you have the R markdown for the book. So the book is a wonderfully coherent structure made up of a whole bunch of R markdown uh, files that can uh, cross-reference one another and also have a single bibliography. And Aaron Lund worked on all the infrastructure to make that stuff work. And then to modularize it further, as I showed you before, for on upcoming versions of R. And one of the things that I said we would do here 
let's first of all check that we're in the right space, right? So we'll say get branch. Here we are. We're on release 312. And uh, just as a as a sanity check back over here, we'll check where we are. We are only in the OSCA folder. So let's do a set WD vignettes uh, book. Okay. And now we can do this command, library R markdown, render Bach memory, that's one of the chapters, dot RMD, and we'll render it to an HTML document. And the virtue of doing this, there are two reasons to do it like this. The first is that if you tried to render it using the buttons up here, it would fail. And we don't really know why. It will fail with some crazy thing having to do with uh, JavaScript. So let's not do that. But in a good world, you'd be able to push this into the R Markdown processor and render it to HTML, and you would get it. But one of the downsides there is that you wouldn't have access to all the nice intermediate computations that are performed as we do this rendering step. And that's what we're going to take advantage of here. So there we go. We have said render. Bach memory, that RMD, it will go and develop some data, and it'll do some computations. What are we actually going to come up with at the end? Well, if we go to the OSCA book, which I happen to have up here, we scroll through this incredible table of contents, eventually we get to case studies, workflows, and we're going to find the Bach memory. I don't skip over it. Moraro, Lawler, Diggersvogel, Pancreas. And mind you, every one of these is in the same form as the Bach memory. So if I, if I succeeded with that, you can do any one of these other experiments. So here's the Bach memory, and this is what is actually being done. Quality control. So there's some data filtering going on. We'll see these displays when we render the uh, the HTML. Uh, then you've got some uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA to get out of there. Uh, then a normalization. And, and the variance modeling. And finally, the dimensionality reduction to get you some clusters. That's what he calls the obligatory Tisney plot of the mammary gland data set. And, um, the paper reference is in the in the, uh, the the Google Doc, and now if we come back here, we see where we are. We're only 47% through, so the normalization is going to take some time. But that's it. So, Sorry, Vince. Uh, what did I, yeah. what did I miss? I don't have the book subdirectory in vignettes. Okay, I think what you may have missed is the checkout of release 312. Uh. Uh, so let's go to the terminal here. And um, my current directory, okay. uh, I got it right? Something's going wrong here. Now, this is an interesting situation we're in. Uh, we're, we're chewing up the CPU uh, by running this thing, and it, the terminal will not answer me right now. So R is busy uh, taking uh, a lot of, yeah, there you go. Now we've got a private command timeout. I don't think these are uh, big problems, but um, this, these computations are apparently uh, hard for the four CPU machine that I, uh, that I took. So buyer beware. Um, it looks like it's moving along very nicely. But just to get back to you, Levi, uh, the Git branch should be released 3.12. I think if it was the master branch, it would be different. But let me know if that's wrong. So um, coming back to the console, uh, this worked despite all the chatter. And that means we can now do the following. Browse URL. And now we have to use some. URL magic, Bach, memory, that HTML. And, you know, if you can do this better than I do, then fine, but that's how I do it. And 
supposedly will fire up your browser and show you everything that was done, including the graphics and the um, final display. So uh, in my view, that satisfies the obligations of the, um, of the pop-up workshop, and we can discuss this. And uh, the, the other obligation that I made was uh, to show you how you would do this with your own data, how you could substitute some of your own data into one of these chapters to get the same processing activities. And we can go over that. We have time for that. But I thought I would just sort of let us uh, see whether there's any questions, discussion. All as smooth as silk. That's what it's, yeah, it's bioconductor. What do you expect? <laughs> um, but really, you know, I, I'd like uh, I'd like to um, to go a little bit further. So let's uh, let's go back to our studio. And um, really use it to try and do some of these modifications that I'm talking about. So so let's let's. Um, this is the uh, this is the rendering. Let's go back to the terminal here. And now, what am I talking about when I say, well, you could do another um, chapter? Uh, one of the chapters I think is interesting is a marker detection. So if we press that here in the files, we come to the chapter itself, marker detection. And um, this is where uh, you can read through this and see what code is being used find markers on the PBMC data. So what in the world is that? You'd like to know. So come back over to the, uh, the console and say library scran and then see what find markers is. So find markers is a function that will find marker genes for groups of cells, and this is telling you what needs to go in. It could be a it could be a summarized experiment, it could be a single cell experiment, and then groups. If you already have have grouped them, yeah, you will have already grouped them, and then you're wanting to find out what are the um, genes that are most discriminatory among the, the various groups, and this tells you what the what the algorithm is. So how long it takes to run find markers uh, on, on a data set, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Let's try it. So we have find markers, and we've also got a single cell experiment out there somewhere, uh, sce.mam. Now, what is sce.mam in terms of its groups? Well, apparently there's a label there. Let's lab let's check that out. SCE.MAM label is a set of group labels. So let's try it. Uh, markers is going to be find markers of SCE.MAM. Let's make sure I get the, uh, the different arguments right. Groups. So the groups are going to be SCE.MAM label. Let's see if that works. Up, oh. MAM. Okay. So, improvise. Find functions, read the book, take some data, try things out. Break it and file an issue. That's, that's what we developers like. To see that our stuff is being used, and now what is this thing that comes back here? class of MMS, it is a simple list. So we should be able to type it out. It's a list of length 10. So what is MMS 1? Aha. It's a data frame. And I guess what it's telling me is that some of these genes are very useful for discriminating group 1. Look at group 2. They're different. You can learn quickly by computing <laughs> no hard.
Other questions? Um, so uh, as you read, you'll be able to reproduce any of the computations and you can mix and match. You know, try one algorithm on another data set and see whether it behaves at all reasonably. Um, the other thing we said is, how do you substitute your own data in? Vincent, so you before you, yeah. can, can, I, can I ask a question? Sorry, to, please, please. No, elegant, no elegant mechanism not to talk over you, sorry. Um, I was going back to that scary looking suggests list in your description file for yes. the book and the packages that were listed there and there were no version numbers uh, on that. I'm, I'm, I'm just worried about, we've got reproducibility right now, but what happens six months time? And how do you manage that, or, or what, what do you suggest we do? Thanks. How about we, let's discuss. Martin, do you have anything to say there? One thing is your, your custom image is uh, totally reproducible. So now that that's yeah. stamped out there with 0 0.0.1, 0 .1, those computations are fixed. If you ran the thing and changed some, some packages, of course, that would change them. That that business is fixed. Go ahead. Also, the the book is fixed as well. Like when you checked out release three twelve, it's the release branch and the release that branch that that release is is now done, right? So it's also fixed. So so far, it's looking pretty good. And I'd say actually, like the next step is like doing your own analysis, which probably involves you know using this container and your own data sets, but then writing a script or a markdown document that itself is under version control. And then, then reproducibility is pretty good. Especially because all of the packages are installed, right? So you don't have to do any compilation or installation. So you suggest having a container for each analysis along with your version, you know? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about my own analysis, right? Not just reproducing the chapter with this particular prepackaged container, but I'm gonna do some exploratory analysis tomorrow or whatever, and then yeah. I'll get back to. I, I think this could devolve pretty quickly. <laughs> so let me just give you one little, um, little piece of uh, help here. And I, I don't know that this has ever been done well enough. But it seems to me that what we're talking about is a signature of an environment, an R environment for analysis and computation. And I know there's a package out there called Session Info, and I would really love it if it knew how to take this information and put it into a, um, an object so we could do comparisons across session infos. Uh, Martin will correct me if there is a, exactly something of that nature, but I think what you're talking about in terms of reproducibility we hope is some sort of signature like this. And as long as nobody's fiddling around with code without changing their version numbers, this is a pretty decent bit of information to help you get reproducible. I think your question about the description file is a very good one because you could say, well, you really should pin down the version of every one of the packages that you want in order for the book to work. Uh, in the way that we would say is really reproducible. And I have a feeling that that is a little too onerous. And that what we have in terms of supporting reproducibility, in terms of specification and signature of an environment, and then going further into the space of containers, which where I'd really rather not be, but you can always be if, you've, if that's your, your cup of tea. I don't feel, as, as you said, you feel nervous about reproducibility. I don't feel that nervous about it here. I think that what's needed in order to get concrete reproducibility is available. But what's really important is to be able to do the computations feasibly. And uh, I think we've got that. If you fixed things too firmly in the description file, you'd get to a point where you might not even be able to install the package because the available versions that you pinned aren't available. Yeah, and that no, I, requires I appreciate that. a bit of coordination among different ecosystems that is not there yet. Yeah, no, that's I didn't a good mean to discussion. talk over you, but yeah. No, that's a, that's a good discussion. I appreciate that. And it's a balance there for sure. Thank you. Oh, 
it's uh, 12.44. I, I, thank you for raising that. I, I think this term reproducibility is thrown around, and I get into such disagreements with people about things that you can and should and so forth that you would think are completely straightforward, and, and they really aren't. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing again so we can see one another. And, um, you know, shares, put your video on. Let's see what the weather is outside your office. Yeah, any. Um, so the other piece then that I said I would do but haven't done yet is um, the uh, how to do things with your own data. And to me, the crux is getting your data into a summarized experiment. And once you've got that, most of these things will work. Single cell experiment, of course, is, is appropriate as well, but the coercion from summarized to single cell is, is straightforward. Um, is there anything anyone would like to look at uh, in some more depth before we wrap up? Um, yeah, let, let's do a little bit more. Let's, let's really work the system. Uh, I'll share a screen again. And uh, what we'll do is we'll reproduce the ontology plot that I showed, and we'll do a little bit more after that, okay? So uh, I don't know why, but it looks to me like I'm missing a little bit of screen here. Just not, uh, not that fast. Yeah, there, there, that's a little bit better. I, yeah, okay, there we go. So the ontology plot is conducted uh, by bringing in another piece of software called Ontoproc, Anvil, Anvil install Ontoproc. And this package can be brought in very quickly because of the um, use of binary repositories, a very uh, interesting and, and somewhat risky business but we're going to take advantage of it here because with that ontoproc, I can get the cell ontology with a single call, CL equals get cell onto. And that cell ontology is an instance of the ontology index class, which is made by a wonderful guy in the UK. I'm forgetting his name, but you could look it up. And uh, having that cell ontology enables me to do the following. Uh, onto underscore plot two, cell ontology, with the ref that we looked at before, it has a, a component called label.ont, which are cell ontology classes. And I'll just take the first 20 of those cell types. And that's what we get. So what we've done is we've gotten a vector of cell ontology labels from the reference data set, which is fortunately annotated with these things. And then the ontology index tooling and so forth will help you build up this display. Let's change it a little bit. Let's do 21 to 40. Or let's even do that. Okay. Now we get a bigger plot. And you see it's a different structure and a different collection of, of, of types of cells. Pretty nice, huh? So um, that is an improvis improvisation. But taking advantage of something that isn't always there, which is when you know something about some cells, use a formal tag in order to tell us what the cell type is. It's not done very often. But we need to get that into our practices. The last thing um, I'd like to do is um, look a little bit more at the, um, the Google Doc. Um, because there's an appendix there that I think is uh, worth having a go at. Everything uh, that I'll show here is in the book, uh, but it's hidden because he wants the book to be readable and not interrupted by all these uh, sequences of unpleasant looking code. So what you've got going on here is with droplet test files, which is a, a very fundamental early resource with peripheral blood mononuclear cells, 4,000 of them that was distributed by the 10X genomics people. That's all sort of packed away in a certain format, and uh, it's tarred and gzipped, and you have to untar that, 
and then start working with it uh, with these codes. This is also um, a utility uh, tool for reading um, the, uh, the data. And finally, we are going to um, get the gene IDs and locations and keep going, get rid of the empty drop, empty droplets, uh, do some quantification, uh, uh, quality control here, uh, deal with mitochondrial DNA, and then do some quick clustering, and finally denoise, and then run TISNI and UMAPs and so forth. And finally, we get a, 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 a network relating the different um, clusters of, of cells. Uh, and we put that on the, um, the, uh, the single cell experiment. So this is the type of code that underlies activities in the, um, in the book. And you can always get access to it, but uh, I wanted to, um, to just put that at the back of this, where we have learned how to do the high level stuff. Now you can actually take advantage of the low level stuff once you start drilling into these R markdown files. So the assets you've got now are Bioconductor, um, the book, Anvil, your accounts in Anvil, which will enable you to do more computation. You might have to get a different billing account once we turn off the, uh, the Deep Pilots one, but that is not so hard to do. And uh, then the Google Doc, the container, uh, and so forth. And that should enable you to, um, to get into quite a bit of, of um, detail with respect to uh, single cell uh, transcriptomics. And, um, you know, if you run into trouble, uh, we have a support site, and uh, I'm happy to take emails from folks who have questions um, uh, about this sort of thing. Aaron is the, the great expert with respect to this entire ecosystem. And uh, if you want to get feedback from him, it's probably best to go on the support site. And um, I think that's about it for what I'd like to present. So any further questions or comments, let me know. Leo, are you Fine. saying something? Yeah, go ahead. So um, how is it, thank you, thank you. Thanks very much for this. Um, how is it would be, to implement this for a new application area, we are building some similar uh, tools for microbiome data. So if we would like to set up something like this, how, how much additional work that is? Great question. And uh, I hope the answer is a pretty straightforward one. The first is your book. I don't know whether you've actually started to work on the R Markdown chapters for the book. If you've already got yeah. those in place, um, I would talk to Aaron a bit about where the book rendering infrastructure is. Uh, I think it's pretty mature. There's the book down, which is used. There's also, I don't know, he's got some other package that does the coordination. Because getting the cross references right and getting the, um, the bibliography right is a little uh, technical, but I think he's got it to a point where you can just use standard markdown type references and it all works out. Whether you need a make file or not to build it, I don't know. Uh, there are things in the description file, I think, that make it all work very nicely. So I would get in touch with Aaron and make sure you can build a book, which can then slide into the Bioconductor book building sequence, I think, fairly straightforwardly. Uh, and then if your question is how to get this onto Anvil, uh, there really isn't very much involved. Uh, if you have the account that you've already got, you can start building a workspace. If you decide to do it based on a container, that's one thing. If you don't want to use a container, but you want to have relatively fast uh, installation, we need to build our binary repository up to a higher level of maturity. And then I don't think you'll even need a container, but you can turn this stuff around very interactively so that you could do a workshop just like this, and we would certainly encourage that. Okay. Sounds, sounds great. Yeah. Thanks very much. Sure. Would you be willing to share your container, your, um, your Docker file? Um, I think. The, or not. This is one of those rare changes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's trivial. The, um, the problem is I don't think I made a Docker file in, in, a, in a rare, it was an emergency this weekend. Uh, nice. So I'll be happy to make a Docker <laughs> file. I don't think it'd be hard. 
uh, basically, you need to do all the checkouts that I've done, run that little dev tools command to go and read the, the, um, the description file, and then it all gets put into the fat container. But that's, you know, that's, that's what the Docker file would be. It's a couple of lines additional to, to Natasha's Docker file. It really is. In passing, it was a lot of fun to see the, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how many of us uh, spun up the instances, but we, m many of us did, at least half of us probably, and uh, we just re requested these compute resources and they were just there. That's totally great. Um, Martin or Vince, um, is there a way in which you could give a description file and get the Docker file? Not that I know. Yeah. yeah, there's no tool to do that right now, but um, I, I, it doesn't sound complicated to the extent that all that we're really talking about is finding a bunch of strings that will somehow be processed uh, to, you know, compose the container. And Robert, please be in touch if you know there's anything that uh, is, is missing in the in the space. That sure, thank you. Yeah. I mean, may, maybe we should look at this um, this command that I've forgotten. <laughs> um, let me go back here. Yeah, I, I think. If we go to the, uh, the, the the more recent version of the book, ah, God, sorry about this. Um, oh. it, it's really the README of the uh, of the uh, the GitHub GitHub.com Oscar source. Okay, so Asuka source, Asuka, there it is, this is it. Install remotes, local package depths, dependencies equals true. So you run that in the folder where the description file lives and that's it. All right, Vince, thanks very much. That's super. Uh, uh, learning a lot about uh, Anvil and containers and uh, the OSCA book, which is a fantastic resource and some of the things that we can do ourselves. So that's totally awesome. Um, next week, I think Levi is going to be talking about using uh, Anvil in teaching and uh, some of his experiences uh, in that, that domain. So that's uh, pretty interesting as well. So thanks everyone for attending and uh, see you all uh, next week. Bye now. Thanks. Bye.